morning, church. Good morning, Kone. Uh, today's teaching text is Mark 1, verse 1. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. At the end of the reading, I will say this is the word of the Lord, and the church can respond, uh, praise be to God. It reads as follows. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we open your word this morning, we know, we confess, we believe, and we expect that uh, your word is a living word and that it can speak to us here and now. Not only can it speak to us, but it can uh, penetrate the deepest parts of our being, mind, soul, heart. We, uh, we learn from you. We hear the voice of your Holy Spirit. You illuminate our minds as we open up the word. We've sung this morning that we want to behold you and that you are the Lord of Lords. We spoke about our new year now and how we feel about it. And now, Lord Jesus, we ask that you speak to us through your word. Give us clarity of thought. Please help us not to be distracted. Fill us up. Make us alive once again. Transform us through your word. We pray that in your name. Amen. Let us pretend that we can hop into a time travel machine. Are you guys ready? So hop in the time travel machine with me quickly, and let's go to the first century. You are one of the people of God, an Israelite, a Jew. You live in a country in modern-day Middle East, promised to you by God, according to a covenant he made with his people. So it wasn't just a by-the-way promise. It was a big promise. And you now live in that country that he promised. Your country at this moment is being occupied by a foreign administration and a foreign ruler. Big, bad Rome. Bloodthirsty. Brutal. Merciless. Worse than any other administration or ruler you've been under in the last few centuries. You're reminded of this daily. Everywhere you go, there are toll booths taking your money for this big bad administration and ruler. Everywhere you go, you see idols, carved images of gods. And your law says, thou shalt not have one of these. And not only do they have one, they have many. All of these different gods worshipped for, uh, for different reasons. They have shrines where they are worshipped. Exploitation is part of your daily bread. Either you get exploited, or you see someone being exploited, or you exploit others because you are being exploited. Yesterday you paid five fishes of tax, today you pay seven. Why? Because that's what the toll guy says. All around you as you go about your business, you see bullying by people. All Everywhere you go, you see the big bad Romans building roads and trade routes. And you see everything that is precious of this country leaving this country to other countries. And it actually belongs to you, but now it gets used for the enrichment of this big bad administration and foreign ruler. You've been relegated to a lower social order. At this point, you are either a day laborer, working, earning, eating, working, earning, eating, working, earning, eating. Or you are trying your best to just eke out an existence so that you can care for your family. You live in a small village, about 150 to 300 people, as big as two football fields. Fam, do you know... If this was the first century, Fellowship City and the church grounds was a, was a village. There we go. If everyone who's part of Fellowship City would pitch, we'll be close to 200 people, and that's it. Like, that would be you. And your whole village would be as big as the church grounds. That's the size of the lives of the people in the first century. You far removed from the big city of Jerusalem. You're not close to it. You're in the northern part of the country. At most, you go to Jerusalem once a year, and that is during Passover, and that is if you have leave, and that is if you have money, because most people only earned 200 wages a year in a 365-day year, so that's money every second day. 
It's a life goal of yours to go to Jerusalem for Passover. Now you, you, believe in the promise of the Messiah. You do. The prophets, among others, are important figures in the history of your people, the Israelites, the people of God. And the prophets said that God will send a king. The prophets said that God will send an anointed one. It means one that is marked by God. A servant, they said, will come. A son, they said, will come. And this servant, son, Messiah, and king will save. He's done it before through the Exodus, and he'll do it again. That's what the prophets promised. This king, this anointed one, will right the wrongs of sin. Will pay the price fully and finally. This Messiah will restore the relationship between God and His people completely. Think about it. As you are in the time machine, you long to be able to approach the throne of grace boldly and with confidence. But you can't. You always have to kill something and burn something first. And it costs a lot of money. And before you can do it, you need someone to help you do it. That's what priests were for. You long to just be able to say, my God. But you can't. Because you've got beef with him. There's distance between you. This Messiah will bring about a new creation. A new way of life. The Old Testament says that God's law will go from stone to your hearts. And you'll know exactly what to do to please God. Yes. Because up until this point, I need someone to interpret the law for me. And I need someone to tell me exactly what to do so that I can be in right standing with God. But I am still not in right standing with God. I long for this time where His law will be here. And I'll know. You believe in the promise of this Messiah because He will rule with justice. Everyone will have what they need. With righteousness, relationships will be repaired between people and between people and God. This king is supposed to bring back Eden that was lost through the sin of, human guy, of, of humankind. You long for good news. Fam, up until this point, God has been silent for approximately 400 years since the prophet Malachi. How long can you wait for a WhatsApp reply? I'm just asking. Do you have any idea how long 400 years is? You hear the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 52 verse 7. Look at it with me. Isaiah says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the herald, the news bringer, who proclaims peace. Yes, that's what I want. Who brings news of good things. Yes, please. Who proclaims salvation. That's what I long for. Who says to Zion, the place where God dwells, Your God reigns. I know these words. They echo in my mind and my heart, but it's just not happening. And then one day, you hear a horse approach. <laughs> Someone on the horse says, good news, good news, new king, new king. And this person starts naming all these promises that comes with this new king. Good tidings for everyone, a better life for all. Less tax for everyone, more jobs for everyone, more safety for everyone. I announce the proconsul Paulus Fabius Maximus announces according to the high priest and the virtue of providence that Caesar Augustus is savior and king. Good news! Good news! <coughs> What a laid down. What a laid down. Why? Because you've seen this movie before. This was a common announcement in the first century world. But it was never what you longed and hoped for. We are in election season. Everyone promising everything that they won't do. We've seen this movie before. 
Things won't change. They lie. Because they want your vote. It's exactly the same in the first century. On the contrary, for you, Jew, Israelite, person of God, it might actually even get worse. Because this new Caesar Augustus is not your king and he's not your God. He doesn't care about you. He only cares about himself. And as you go about your business, someone tells you about a man called Jesus. Rumor has it that he's the one you've been waiting for. Tell me more about this. And then the person says, well, it started, the rumor goes, within, with an angelic announcement. Not a human one. Did you guys see the horse just now? Not one like that. It was an angelic announcement. And then a confirmation of that announcement by people who saw him with their own eyes. Do you guys remember the words of Christmas? Can I show it to you again? Luke chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. But the angel said to them, not the herald, the angel. Don't be afraid. For look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy. And it will be for all people, not only for Roman citizens. Today in the city of David, a Savior is born. That's the one you're waiting for. Who is the Messiah, the one that was promised? The Lord, the one will, that will rule as king. Oh, oh, oh. Tell me more. Tell me more. Show me where he is. This is the one that I have been longing for. Take note of the highlights, Savior, Messiah, and Lord. We'll get back to them. Mark, the writer of one of our four Gospels, assumes that you know the story of the Old Testament. He assumes you know everything I just mentioned. Now, I didn't assume that, so that's why I mentioned them. Do you guys see it? Okay. That is why his gospel account starts in this way. Look at it. There you go. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Did our little time travel now help you to understand why this is really great news? Yes? No? Was it the horse sound? <laughs> I think it was the horse sound. No, I'm joking. Our sermon today will cover these highlights. So you guys know I usually give you my points as a map in a sermon. There's your points. Right there. We're going to cover beginning, gospel, Jesus Christ, Son of God. Today is the first sermon in the gospel of Mark. We will be in Mark until Easter. So reading it uh, in this first part of the year, I think will actually be really helpful to you. It will be really beneficial to you. Some of our D groups are going to read Mark together as well. If you want to do it in one sitting, you could probably read Mark in two and a half to three and a half hours. But truth be told, I actually don't know if any human being living on the planet today can actually still sit and read for three and a half hours. I don't know. I mean, I could do it back in the day. I can still do it today, but I read a lot. And I don't think that other people actually read that much. So you can do it two and a half to three and a half hours if you want to. Let me just show you something about Mark quickly. Two quick slides. The first one is, Mark is a human being. Hey? Full name, John Mark. And Mark lived in the first century. It's the fellow in the middle. And what we know of Mark is that Mark used to work with Peter. And Mark used to work with Paul. Two of the biggest apostles in the New Testament. And what we know from the church father called Papias is that Peter told the story and Mark wrote it down. So most of Mark's gospel comes from what Peter told him. And he took all of these stories and he put them in an order which ended up being the gospel according to Mark. Are you with me? Second slide. Don't panic. I just want to show you one thing. It's a, it's a busy gospel. There's a lot going on. And it happens really, 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 really quickly. Like as you read Mark, even if you are really focused, you'll read over a transition and you won't even notice it. And then once the story develops, you go, whoa, 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 did Jesus move? Oh yeah, he did. He was there, 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 and there in one chapter. My word, he's working really hard. Here's what I want you to see. The whole chapter 1 to 8 is situated in Galilee, and it's all about answering the question, who is Jesus? Okay? 
So chapter 1 to 8, as we progress through the weeks to come, what you'll see is revelations about Jesus. You'll see Jesus himself teaching about the kingdom. You'll see Jesus doing things and showing the kingdom. We'll hear Jesus teaching in parables about the kingdom. All of it is supposed to answer the question, who is Jesus? Are you with me? Okay, nice one. Why Mark? Firstly, because we celebrated the birth of Jesus at Christmas. We are headed to his death and resurrection during Easter. The Gospel of Mark describes what happened in between. And we are actually in between now. So it just makes sense, right? It'll help us to see the story in its fullest. We are also a gospel-centered church. Bethany explained that earlier. So we say that the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ is everything. So we might just as well study his perfect birth, life, death, and resurrection. And then lastly, this is a new one for Fellowship City. We actually haven't preached through a gospel yet. So it's time to do so. It's going to be fun. Why should you care? Because you need a fresh start. You do. I know. I also do. Look at the first word in the teaching text. The beginning. Do you guys remember which other Bible book starts with the word in the beginning? Genesis. And Genesis is where it all starts. It's one Hebrew word. Bereshit. Bereshit. It means in the beginning. So when Mark uses the word the beginning, what is he hinting at? A restart. A new beginning. Mark is hinting at a recreation. Mark is hinting at rewriting history. Volume 1. Now check this, volume 2. And it's, got, it's going to get even better. That's what Mark states this is. A fresh start. And not a fresh start because it's Jan. Not a fresh start because you stuck to your New Year's goals for two weeks this year. A fresh start because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll get there now. How was your 2023? Did you take some time to reflect on the wins and the losses? Did you take some time to reflect on your obedience and your disobedience? I don't know of a lot of people who sit and go, hmm, where did I actually intentionally disobey God this year? Did you say thank you to God for all the wins? And did you repent when you needed to? from all the losses and all the disobedience. How do you feel about 2024? Did you resolve to do anything different or new this year? I just want to tell you that if you need a fresh start and some good news, then this word and this verse is for you today. There's a trend currently, and that trend is, let me choose a word for the new year. So my word for 2024 is, people do that. It's all right. You can do it if you want to. I'm all for it. I want to make a suggestion, though. What about a verse? One verse. Seven Greek words. Twelve English words. How about this? As a verse for your year. Hey? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's go. The introduction to this gospel according to Mark, is like a movie poster. Do you guys still remember what a movie poster looks like? Like main character, main event, and then a few other smaller characters, and some smaller events. It helps you to see who's playing the main role, yeah? And it also helps you to see what you can expect if you go and watch the movie. Do you know what I mean? Like think Barbie last year, lots of pink. <laughs> think Oppenheimer last year, <laughs> massive explosion. Do you know what I mean? Think any Marvel movie, the end of the world. It's always like that. So that's what Mark does. Mark puts Jesus in the center so that you can know what to expect from him and what you should focus on. Now we've already covered the word beginning. I said you can expect a restart. So let's look at the word gospel. We've already seen that gospel means good news. Now mostly it's good news about a king, but it was also used in general speech purely as the words good news. 
We see this if you take letters from the first century or writings from the first century. If you look at people like Josephus, Cicero, Plutarch, all of them were writers in the first century. They would use the word gospel, evangelion, it's the Greek word, as good news. Now, I'm just mentioning those names for reference. I don't know if any of you at night time read some war stories from Josephus before you go to bed, okay? I just had to mention that as reference. Now, why is this good news? Fam, because there's bad news. Do you know that you are separated from God because of your sin? That's really bad news. Sin is not doing what God commanded and instead doing what He prohibited. That's sin. No one is exempt from it. Unfortunately, you see sin from the moment you enter this world and you start doing it before you can even think about it. Can anyone remember what sin they did when they were two to three years old? No, no one can, but I promised you that you sinned. Because I saw our kids sin between two and three like machines. So you start doing it before you even think about it. And you can't pretend that it's not there because you did it. Do you guys realize that we live in a world where people would say to you, no, no, listen, Rhino, I really enjoy this chat about sin, but I actually don't sin. I'm actually quite a good person, you know, and I try and live a really, really good life. And do you know what my answer always is to that is, can I ask someone else who knows you? Because according to you, you don't sin. But see, here's the problem with sin. You do it in your own body to other people. And they can testify against you. So you can think that you're good, but you're not. Because you can't only sin here. And you can't only sin here. It comes out here. It comes out here. It comes out here. That's bad news. So you can't deny it. So more bad news, your days on earth is limited. You will die. And if you die estranged and separated from God, you will spend eternity separated from Him. That is called hell. And that's really bad news. Can I tell you some more bad news? You were created to be in a relationship with God. And if you're not in a relationship with God, you're living with a, a massive hole in your soul that can only be filled by Him. You'll never find anything that satisfies. You long to know Him, you long to be with Him, you long to experience Him for who He is, but you can't make Him forget everything that you have done. Do you, have you ever had conflict with a spouse or someone you love, and you want to approach them, but you know that they haven't forgotten what you did to them? <laughs> and you so wish that, that you could do something, just go, lovey, forgive me. Ah, it's all done. Woo! Hello, D, how are you doing? <laughs> no, I mean, it doesn't work that way doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, you can't, make any, you can't do anything to make God forget everything that you've done. You can't pay your debt because the price of death, oh, sorry, the price of sin is death. Someone has to die to pay. And you can't die and pay, so you can't pay. That's bad news, fam. And that's why the Gospel of Mark is good news. Because of the one named Jesus, whose name means, listen to it, God saves. Do you know that? That's what Jesus means. It means God saves. And this one called Jesus arrives on the scene to do exactly that. And that is to save. To reverse the curse that I just described. Also, he's not any Jesus. He is Jesus Christ. Do you see the name? The Old Testament, listen to it, promises the marked and appointed one that will do the work and will be the king. In the Old Testament, that word is the word Messiah. So the Old Testament uses the word Messiah to describe this marked and appointed one. Christos is the Greek word for Messiah. So, what Mark says is this is the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah. That's what Christ means. It's not his surname. I hate it when Christians say, so actually now that I'm in the family of God, my name is Reino Christ. You are not a Christ. You can't be. It's impossible. Because it's a title. 
It's not a surname. Fascinating. Do you know that the Gospel of Luke never refers to Jesus as Jesus Christ? It's only ever Jesus. Interesting. Check this. The Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew only uses Jesus Christ in the beginning. And then in the rest of the Gospel, they talk about Jesus. Why? Firstly, so that you can be sure who they are writing about and what to expect. Do you see that? Mark doesn't want you to wonder, is this Jesus the Messiah or is it not? Is this the one that the Old Testament is talking about or not? Mark makes it plain. Yes, the one who saves, the one who's the Messiah. There you go. That's what I'm going to write about. Oh, and let me just add, <laughs> Son of God. We'll get there now. Matthew does the same. Before Matthew starts, he wants to make sure that you know who he's writing about. And then, as you read the gospel, and as they write the gospel, the revelation of Jesus, this means what Jesus shows of himself and what he says with his mouth, leads to this confirmation and confession. In all four gospels, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, Who do you say I am? And what does Peter say? You are the Messiah. You are Christ. And then the author goes, winning. Do you see? Because as I wrote the story, as all of these things were revealed, it confirmed what I said about him in the beginning. And that is that he is the anointed one. He is the Christ. Are you guys with me? Quick sidebar for all the Bible nerds in the house. Whoop, whoop. This is the only time in the whole gospel of Mark that Mark explicitly states who Jesus is according to him. Once does Mark tell you, this is who I think Jesus is. He's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There you go. The rest of the story, Mark just throws the stories at you. <laughs> and he wants you to decide for yourself. Fam, I need to pause and ask you, do you know that this is the one who we speak of? In this church, if we say we are a Jesus church, we say we're a gospel-centered church, do you know that this is what we mean? That He is the Savior, that He's the Anointed One, that He brings good news because of all the bad news, and that He is the Son of God, and that He gives a possibility of a fresh start and a restart for you. Do you know this? This is what we preach. If you are not a believer here today listening to me, do you know that this counts for you? It counts for you. The restart, because of the good news, because of the one who saves, counts for you. And it can count for you today. Today can be the day that you restart. Today can be the day in which you say, I admit, I admit my lostness and my brokenness and my sin. And I believe in Jesus. And I confess Him as my Lord and Savior. That day can be today. We're going to, do, to do, <coughs> we're going to do that at the end of the service. So if something's prompting you, don't harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. If you're a seasoned saint and you've been a believer for ages, do you know that this is what He did for you? He gave you another chance by paying the price because that's what He said He'll do. And He's the one that could reconcile you to God finally. Do you know that? Fam, if you're a mature Christian and someone stops you at any time of the day and they say, what are you thankful for? Your first answer has to be salvation. It has to be. Sometimes we go, ah, oh, you know, the weather, it's all right, fiber, Burger King, my job, what? Is that the first thing that comes to mind? The first thing that comes to mind should be my salvation. And also, do you know that this means that Jesus is running the show here? Do you know that this means that Jesus is calling the shots and He is reigning as King here in this place and in your life? Jesus isn't an all-round nice guy. They enjoyed good company and wore flip-flops. People often talk about him like that. Fam, listen to me. He is so much more. 
Jesus is exalted. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is almighty. Jesus is holy. Do you know this? That's the Jesus that this gospel is talking about. And I believe it is critical that we are clear on the answer to this question, especially in this time we live in. Fam, we have people in this country, a nominally Christian country, that say that they believe in Jesus, but their lives show nothing of it. Nothing. People say with their mouths, I am a Christian and I believe in Jesus. So they confess it with their mouths, but they definitely don't believe it with their hearts because it shows nowhere in their lives. And also in South Africa, we have this vibe of, no, no, look, I can do like 50-50. Do you know what I mean? Like some places in my life, it does show that I follow Jesus, but then other places... It doesn't. And that's okay. I mean, none of us are perfect now, are we? That's how people in this country roll. I think we should be really, really clear on why this is an important question. The text shows us that Jesus doesn't allow us to sit idle. Like, you have to make a decision. Is he the king? Is he the son of God? And will he say yes on his terms? It's either yes or no. There's no pending there's no middle. There's no weight. Often, if people say to me they are exploring Christianity, I would say to them, I'm really glad that you are. I just want you to know that exploring Christianity doesn't exempt you from a yes or no. At some point, you're going to have to say yes. Because every time that you don't say yes, you say no. And I need you to know that. And that's why I keep on sharing the gospel with you, because every time you say no, you are still estranged from God. There's no maybe here. He's either king or he's not. Ooh, says the old preachers. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. Let's give thanks to the old preachers, right? They had a way of saying these things in a really witty way. Uh, let's call up an old preacher, Tim Keller. Look at what he says. He says, if we say, I believe in Jesus, but it doesn't affect the way we live, the answer is not that now we need to add hard work to our faith so much as that we haven't truly understood or believed in Jesus at all. I'm not going to argue with Tim Keller. Just say Look at what N.T. Wright says about the book of Mark. He says, Mark is a book to challenge believers who are committed only as far as their own convenience allows urging them to embrace the self-giving love of the way of Jesus. Fam, this book is going to make us uncomfortable. And this book is going to challenge us like you would not believe. I read Mark 9 and 10 this morning in my normal devotions. Rapper. I just had to sit with it. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, this, these are such convicting words. Okay, so who is he? He's Jesus Christ, we saw that. Last one, Son of God. I hear this often. How can you say that Jesus is truly the Son of God? Here's the simplest answer. Because God said He is. Can I show you? Fast forward 10 verses. God speaking. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. <laughs> I'm trying to do a Morgan Freeman. I'm just not nailing it. <laughs> With you... I am well pleased. There you go. God himself says that Jesus is his son. Mark says that Jesus is his son. Every time you read in the gospel, the son of God, every time that title gets used, it gets backed up with quotes from the Old Testament to help you understand why it is so important that he is the son of God. Why? So that the hearer and the reader can be sure. The very next verse in the Gospel of Mark, which we don't have time for today, Mark starts quoting like a machine to back up this statement of him. Let's land. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Do you know what will happen if you memorize this verse? If you recite it daily? And if you prayed into your life every single day this year, do you know what will happen? I have a few hunches. Firstly, you'll have less regrets. 
Because I know you have regrets about last year. I know. I do too. You'll have less regrets if you recite this, if you memorize this, and if you pray this. Why? Because you'll realize the gift of every new start. And you'll use your time to the glory of God. You'll start believing the truth that God never runs out of second chances for you. Fam, this is the biggest lie that our people struggle with. And that is that God at some point says, I am done with you. He's not. He's never done with you. Never, ever, ever. The beginning, the beginning, the beginning. You can start afresh every single day. But you have to read this verse and you have to let this good news go into your heart so that that settles your identity. If you believe this verse, you'll be settled in identity that says you are loved. Why? Because of the good news. Not because of anything you did. John chapter 3.16 says, For God so, is it examined the world, rated the world, Tested the world. No, for God so loved the world. That's why all of this happened. You are loved. You can do nothing that will make God love you more, and you can do nothing that will make God love you less. That's great news, fam. Every single day. If you read this, recite this, memorize this, and let this seep into your heart, you'll be thankful for your salvation. And fam, do you know what happens if you are thankful for your salvation? You become humble. You are less self-righteous thinking that you're a good person. You are less self-reliant because you know that you can't save yourself and you couldn't save yourself. You will grow in worship, knowledge, and intimacy of God through His risen Son. Have I made, it? Have I made my point? I can keep going. This will greatly benefit you. The point is that you should try it. And the point is that all of us should try it. We are a gospel-centered, disciple-making church. So this is right on target. There you go. Gospel. Right in the middle. I'm excited about this first part of the year. We're going to take our discipleship journey. And we are going to journey through it. And we're going to invite everyone to join us on this discipleship journey. Can I show it to you quickly? Again. We showed this to you last year as we did our basic discipleship series. And we also shared this with you at our vision casting events. How do we know that we are being made into disciples? Well, a disciple loves God and loves people. And how does a disciple do that? A disciple knows God, a disciple commits faithfully, and a disciple gives generously. How do we do that? A disciple knows God through His Word. We're going to study a whole gospel. Through encountering Him. And through worship, both musical and a lifestyle of worship, a disciple commits faithfully to transformation. That's the change that the Spirit brings to God's people, this place, and to the mission of the church, where we are headed as a church and why we're called. And a disciple gives generously of time, talents, and treasures. You were given something by God that is His, not yours. And therefore, you should give generously of it because it never belonged to you. It belongs to Him. And we call it time, talents, and treasures. We call it service, gifts, and money. That's what we are called to. That'll transform you. That'll transform us. And it all starts with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The first six months of this year, we will ask you to prioritize Sundays. Pitch on a Sunday, fam. Make that your first priority. Do not ponder coming to church on a Saturday night at half past nine while you're scrolling useless reels. Don't do it. Decide now that on Sunday mornings, we, my family, my house, or whoever is with you will be at church. We've got a lot of exciting things coming in the first part of this year. We'll communicate all of them to you. We'll have baptism again. We'll celebrate communion every month this year. We'll keep on asking you to give of your time and of your talents. We'll keep on asking you to start serving to find a place where you can give. And we're going to keep on asking you to give of your treasures as well. Not because we want them, but because they can be an idol in your life. And the only way to make sure that money isn't an idol is by giving it away to the kingdom. We're going to keep on asking you these things. And all of these things are rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Lord Jesus,
we praise you for a fresh start. It's so easy for us to give up on people. It's easy for us to give up on ourselves. It's easy for us to cancel others. And that just makes it so difficult to believe and to know that you don't do that to us. Thank you for not doing that to us. Thank you for offering us the beginning year today. I want to pray for everyone who resonates with that. That they would just feel the burdens that they're carrying leaving their shoulders, leaving their bodies, lifting from their souls, clearing out their minds. May this truly be a fresh start, a new creation moment for everyone who longs for that, Lord Jesus. I thank you for saving. I thank you for saving us. I thank you for saving people in this very moment. And I thank you that this saving is because of your love and not because of anything that we did. Lord Jesus, you gave it all and therefore you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of, of our best efforts. We know we can't earn anything, but we know that when we commit to you, that means that you are Lord and we are not. And Father God, I pray that in this time, as we either commit our lives to you for the first time or we recommit our lives to you. That we would feel your tender mercies and your grace meeting us in exactly that same place. Welcoming us home. Saying to us, welcome home. I've waited for you. I want to throw a party for you. I want to clothe you. I want to restore you. Father, then I pray for all of us that carry around regrets of 2023 that have made our lives something that doesn't bring glory to you. I pray for all of us that were moved to see you again today for who you really are. May we never, ever, ever forget that awe and reverence and worship. Your name be lifted, I, Lord Jesus, because of the gospel because you are the Christ, because you are the Son of God. We submit our lives to you, and we proclaim that you are our living hope. We pray that in your name.